You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now it's time for the show that breaks down the options market from unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts Uncle Mike Tussaw from RCM Asset Management, Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi from OptionPit.com, and Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian from OptionPit.com. And now, get ready to hit the Option Block. All right, everybody. That rock and tune means it's time to rock out with your favorite bi-weekly option show. Yes, it's time for the option block. Speaking of time, you're saying, wait a minute, what's, what are they doing coming at me at this crazy time of noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern? Those guys always do 3 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Eastern. I would say you're right. We used to do that. Uh, for 700 some hot episodes, that was our time frame. But you know, sometimes things evolve, things change. This seems to uh, to work better for everybody here this time. And we thought maybe we'd mix it up there for you guys. Too. I know you guys hate change, but it didn't seem like too many of you were averse to the idea of a show coming at you actually during the trading day, mixing it up a little bit as opposed to right after the close. Uh, so a little bit different in that sense. But uh, if you're if you like it, if you don't like it, let us know. You, you, you're not shy about letting us know. So do exactly that. Everything else is pretty much the same. You can still get it via Mixler in terms of the live stream. Uh, it'll just be coming at you at a different time. Uh, everything else will be, uh, you know, the podcast uh, will be on, you know, the iTunes, the website, everywhere else that it usually is our mobile app. It's a chance. We'll see. See if we can get our gears in motion here on the old network. There's a chance we could even maybe turn the podcast around same day, which would be nice. You don't have to wait until the next uh, morning to hear the show. Uh, in terms of, for all you subscribers out there, you can listen to it maybe even, God forbid, on your commute home, <laughs> which would be kind of nice. Uh, so we're, we're working on, uh, on getting that, investigating that. Don't hold me to that. We're going to try. Uh, but uh, that's kind of all part of this effort, just to keep you guys happy, which we like to do so let us know what you think about this new bat time this new same bat channel new bat time if it works better for you if you like having us coming at you in your ear holes during the trading day or maybe if you prefer the little right after the close of the trading day what, what do you like better let us know you guys are not shy so uh, hit us up you know the do it website social media add options on most of the major platforms or our mobile app you can hit us up there or on the Mixer live feed, if you're in there, then you know we're changing live time. So <laughs> there you go. However you do it, we do like to hear from you guys. And let's see who we got on this crazy new time. They wanted it. They got it. Let's see who we got. Let's spin the old option block wheel. Oh, first off, we land in a place uh, a little bit a little bit farther <laughs> from uh, from Chicago, all the way out in the hinterlands of Maine, I believe he is within spitting distance. He can see the ocean. It is lapping at his window as we speak. Hopefully not that close. <laughs> With the rock lobster, Andrew Gibbonazzi uh, from OptionPit.com. Mr. G, welcome back to the show. How's this, how's this new bat time working for you, sir? Um, I'm, I'm here, and I, uh, my, my shoulders are a little sore, actually, because I, I actually tried to paddle on a surfboard for the first time in years. And I have to admit, I'm uh, pretty out of shape. It's a little sore. <laughs> Breaking news, Andrew the there Rock Lobster. Go. Not much of a surfer. <laughs> no, is there a big? A, is there a big surfing s- scene in Maine? Uh, actually, there is. There's some uh, really nice surfing beaches. Um, so, so, but it's only you know the season is not super long. Probably uh, you know June to late September. It's the six week so, surfing season. Exactly. Uh, not, not very long. 
Well, there you go. Yeah, that's a fun image. Maybe we'll find a picture of the rock lobster surfing and, uh, and send it out for all of you to see. That would just be terrifying, I think, for... We'd lose many subscribers then. But, you know, sometimes you got to do what you got to do. And also joining us, I believe, from uh, the mobile St. Charles office. You know, he gets what he asked for, and he, he still can't make it. Let's give him a hard time, listeners. It is Uncle Mike Tusa from RCM. Actually, uh, currently with RCM, but now hanging his hat at St. Charles Wealth Management. Uncle Mike, welcome back to the show. Where the heck are you today, sir? Albuquerque, Poughkeepsie, Des Moines. Uh-oh. He's so far away. Edward Earl's Wealth Management. There you are. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> He's back and ready to rock. All right, with the team assembled at this crazy new time, let's dive right on into the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for the trading block. All right, everybody, welcome to the trading block. This is, of course, the portion of the show where we break down, you know, what the heck is trading? And right now, it, it really literally is what's trading. Now, this is kind of weird, guys. I don't know if I'm used to this, uh, you know, live markets during the option block. Doesn't it feel kind of weird? It does. Very weird. <laughs> I don't know, I'm still kind of wrapping my uh, heads around. Oh, it looks like I might have got filled on some stuff. I'm unloading a whole bunch of VXX downside as we speak. A good day to do it because the markets are uh, rallying. Uh, Rallying, well, not they were rallying, now they're kind of more in mixed territory uh, with uh, S&P up slightly. The Q's up a little more than that, about two-tenths of a percent, and uh, the Dow kind of literally unched <laughs> on the day. Uh, all this means uh, VIX Cash kind of taking a relaxing break to the downside, but you know what? It's kind of been, uh, it's been aggressively moving to the downside ever since our last show. In fact, uh, if it holds on this pace and stays around here, then all of us were exceedingly optimistic with our upside uh, in VIX. We were talking, I was talking downside, and yet it was nowhere near uh, pessimistic, I should say, really enough, in terms of net vol, because we're looking at it right around 1075 in VIX cash land right now. So well south of the 11 handle, and all that puts our old friend uh, VXX 2788 off another quarter. So the big mystery, when will VXX break the 30 handle? Guess what? We blew through it uh, this week. So unfortunately, our poll, our last poll had all the way out to a week of ending August 3rd. So we didn't have this week. So we didn't give you all you listeners out there a chance to choose this week. But a lot of you did choose last our last Friday flash poll at VXX would break 30. All of you said hell no. A lot of you said hell no. And you were correct. And uh, so we had to wait till this week when it just exploded through <laughs> to the downside. So uh, interesting stuff afoot there. Let's start in the land of uh, of maine while mr rock lobster gets himself uh, or mr uncle mike gets himself settled back in the saint charles office mr uncle mike or mr mr rock lobster i should say easy for me to say this new time killing me but uh mr rock lobster so clearly now that vix is below the 11 handle clearly we are now in zone negative six right <laughs> deep 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 and negative six this is what is this now this is the first time we've been in zone one for two straight weeks i think um, at least one solid week since January. So um, this is, uh, um, I, I guess it's, it's, this is how we spent most of 2017, but it probably is not familiar to everybody. Uh, and it's a, it's a topic in our, my little volumes letter discussion this week on, you know, how your trading style changes when VIX gets down here. So um, uh, if you're a vol trader, you're, you're, your your style changes, but maybe if you're a diehard bull like Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Tusa, um, you know it might change a little bit as well because the vol is a lot lower. But there is opportunity down this low, and um, what I, it is is now all of a sudden the futures get real expensive relative to the cash because nobody wants to sell the futures down there. But I mean, even last week VXX was four or the August future was like fourteen dollars. Um, and now it's in the 12. So it is starting to, it is starting to, let's just say, um, uh, absorb the fact that, you know, maybe not a lot has happened, not a lot is going to be happening in the short term. It does seem to be so. aggressively absorbing that. That's such a, yes. if you can, if you can aggressively absorb nothing, that's exactly, <laughs> that's exactly what the market is doing right now. And reflecting that, you know, we hear, we hear rumors of trade wars escalating, you know, some earnings weren't that great. Others were spectacular. So kind of a weird mixed bag uh, for earnings season there, but all that amounting to a heck of a lot of continued upside 
for the indices today kind of being a little bit of a break from that uh, continued upside. And of course, a lot of downside in terms of volatility, which I know a lot of you out there like. So after waiting so long for that 28, or actually that 30 handle, uh, it's just like uh, like VXX just never even remembered it, just blew right through it, which is uh, I'm sure making a lot of you out there right now quite happy. Speaking of happy, Mr. Uncle Mike, you're our perma bull here on the show. Uh, so what's making you happy these days? What's catching your eye in, the, in these live markets today, sir? The live markets. Well, it's making me sad that I couldn't say my trade. I was hoping I could say my trademark saying um, <clears throat> with new all-time highs for the debut of the noon hour show, uh, but I can't, unfortunately. But it's pretty close. Uh, in terms of uh, what's going on so far today, uh, we do have uh, an SPY. We're, we're, we're almost touching the 286 level, but we kind of have been doing that for the last couple of days, and uh, we can't seem to break through there. So we're roughly... Um, about a dollar, at least in SPY land, away from new all-time highs. Uh, it's something that could happen at the drop of a hat, as we all know. But uh, the concerning side of it, of course, is that we have not done it as of yet. Uh, so I went to college in Missouri, and uh, in Missouri, it's uh, the show-me state. Uh, at least that's what all the Missouri residents always told me all the time, and the market kind of needs to show me. Uh, the other things to, of note uh, for right now, from a sector standpoint, uh, the only thing that's really do the the sector that uh, appears to be moving the most at this point is consumer discretionaries looking at XLY up roughly a half a percent. Uh, and then in terms of some individual names, at least the ones with which I follow, uh, we do have the fruit company up a nice one percent on the day. And uh, well, what the heck? Never before in the history of the entire stock market has apple ever been higher and has there ever been a better time to sell apple than right now now it's a trillion dollar company making new all-time highs uh, now does that mean it's going to be going down right away eh, i don't think so but at least i got to say my saying in some way on the debut of our noon hour show the noon hour the noon option block hour i kind of like that it's got a little bit of a little bit of a ring to it out here there are some names even though we are coming at you at this funky time since we're talking funk, Funko popping off after the bell, makers of all those uh, silly pops of which there are so many, including a few I'm looking at right now here in the old studio. We have a we have a one or two, or two hundred of those things. Uh, but uh, yeah, Funko uh, trading right now 1964 up about looks like about 44 cents, about 2.3 percent. So looking good, even though their earnings are after the bell today. Let's see, right around there, kind of. Not a lot of strikes to choose from in Funko land, so the 20, the 20 straddle looks like, listen, right around four bucks here, so pretty juicy here for what they're, what they're pricing in. There are no weeklies in Funko, so that's a, that's a surprisingly aggressive, what are they, what are they expecting here in uh, Funko? I guess there's a lot of potential action here in uh, in funko pop land mr rock lobster any of the crazies in the pit chat slinging some funko let's see how many what we got here it does 438 contracts a day today doing 1300 about 2.3 to 1 calls over puts out there mr rock lobster any of your crazies slinging funko and if not what are what are they slinging out there today i'm guessing a lot of vxx anything else um <laughs> funko <laughs> no not that i know of on the funko um what are they slinging? Um, we are looking at downside in Tesla, looking at how cheap SPX is. Um, and uh, v looking at like junk VXX puts again because all this, um, all this, all of this, uh, let's just call it action is um, all of this, uh, you know. Let's call it vol action. Just makes you know puts in the vol products that much more interesting. Um, so I mean that's basically what we're looking at. And besides just Apple going straight to the moon, that's another thing that um, seems to be taken over for the most part. Apple to the moon, indeed. You know, I touched on. I, I put out a little quick hit for you guys. You know, we, there was uh, all sorts of gremlins conspiring against us, which helped precipitate our move to the noon Central Time uh, here on the show. A lot of gremlins on Monday. So I, did, I was able to get a quick hit out 
for you guys where I kind of touched on these. Let me do a really quick. I'll do a quick rundown in case you missed that one, listeners, uh, in case you were in the live stream and you couldn't hear stuff. It was, of course, looking at the numbers for July from OCC. Uh, equity options volume up overall. About Overall exchange-listed options volume from OCC in July up 17% from a year ago. Uh, drilling down a little bit, equity options volume up uh, 20% from July of last year. Cleared ETF options volume up 11% from a year ago, and index options down 6%. Index have kind of been the laggard of late. Not quite the laggard that futures are, though. Cleared futures over there at OCC down 43% from a year ago. Their ADV year-to-date in futures cleared over at OCC is down 23% from a year ago. So they clear a lot of stuff at OCC. Most of that, though, is VIX futures, and that's uh, that's not exactly... A, uh, <laughs> a bellwether stat. Mr. Rock Lobster, has that last one surprised you at all? Or is that kind of what you expected with uh, XIV dead, SVXY, kind of a pale shadow of its former self? Uh, it seemed like the futures are, are suffering a bit. Uh, it, it does not surprise me. Um, and what what's funny is with what Vol has done, <laughs> you know, why, why do they choose to kill the products then? <laughs> you know? Wouldn't it be better to change the leverage when they were at all-time high? I, I, <laughs> I guess nobody thinks to do that stuff. Um, but anyway, um, it does not surprise me that 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 future volumes and also SIBO stock price. I think was what 135 <coughs> bucks in December, um, and I think it's right around 100 dollars now. What 100, 102 or something like that. 93 so, as we speak, sir. Yeah. So I I think the SIBO's definitely that has they've definitely gotten hurt from that. Um, so, and I think the stock price reflects it. Um, and again, I'm changing the leverage on those products. Uh, well, you know, I clearly was not a fan of that. It certainly didn't do our fund any, any favors at all. Um, by, you know, changing, I, I thought the, uh, I still believe, and I still think, uh, you know, the OCC was incorrect on that by letting them basically just essentially you change the underlying of the product. Um, you change the underlying index drastically, which is the whole idea of adjusting the strikes and stuff like that to compensate an option holder. So um, it still is still kind of a rankler, and I, I think that did nothing to add to confidence in the market. To be honest, I think it did the opposite. Um, so, and, you know, I guess just looking at the volume numbers, and that's I, that's kind of in there, you know what I mean? Just... They did not help the option market at all by what they did, and you know people left the volatility space. I think a bit as a re as a result of that. Well, yeah, you know when they have a, a name that's pretty much fundamentally altered within a few hours of the trading day, with no warning, no insight, no no real real way to adjust it themselves at all. You're right. That's going to leave a mark on the product and SIBO. SIBO feeling the heat of that, and obviously the fact that all these regulatory agencies have them under scrutiny these days as well. Probably not helping their stock either, so kind of a bit of a one-two punch uh, for them over there. But let, let's uh, let's end it really quickly on, on a silly, silly fun note. Since we're talking all this dire stuff, <laughs> this came across our tape here, and it just brought a smile to my face. So, in case you're out there, Mr. Rock Lobster, Uncle Mike, next time you guys go out and get an oil change, and you're complaining to you, you're like, "Man, this, this is expensive." Whatever you spend, you get maybe you get the premium oil, so you go up. I don't know, maybe you get a fifty-dollar oil change, you go super crazy. Uh, you get super premium oil, all, all the bells and whistles on your oil chain. Maybe you go crazy, 100 bucks. You get some extra services. You go nuts with your oil change. Well, apparently, <laughs> if you had a Bugatti Veyron, granted, it's a, it's a pricey car, an oil change would cost a whopping $21,000 uh, because apparently they have to dismantle the car to change the oil. <laughs> so that's a well-designed car. And so, I mean, if you're, a, you know, if you're an oil tycoon chic you know, driving a Bugatti Veyron, a million plus dollar car. You're probably not sweating that, but still thought that was kind of funny. It brought a smile to my face. Hopefully that brought a, a smile to yours as well. Next time you're complaining about your $20 oil change at Jiffy Lube. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Andrew, does that bother you that for, since you have like four Bugattis that you have to pay that much for an oil change? <laughs> it, you know, every, every, every time I have to change the oil, that actually costs me another car. Um, it, it's <laughs> Well, it's hard to believe somebody that's that rich that can afford a million dollar car is that stupid, to, you know, to waste 20 grand on an oil change. It's just, I guess if you have that much money, you don't care. But I can never imagine having that much money where I just don't 
you know. Yeah, you can, have, just, you can have a Prius just, or a Ford Fiesta or an oil change <laughs> for your car. To me, that's just like, you know, that's like that's the guy just burning, you know, $100 bills, but a lot of $100 bills, 200 of them. It's like, the, it's, so, like the, it's like the old joke. I think it was Jay Leno's joke that he didn't care how much money he made or how rich he got. He could never eat and enjoy like the $10 Snickers bar from the mini bar in the hotel room. He just couldn't do it. It was just he was, it was too gouging expensive, even no matter how much money he had. And I think this this falls in a similar category. I don't care how much money you have. Twenty one grand for an oil change is kind of silly. Just a fun little a fun little stat to put a sparkle in your day, listeners, as we keep on going into the dark side of the options business. It is time for the odd block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by TheOptionsInsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. Everybody, that funky tune means it's time for the funky part of the show. Even funkier than those oil changes, it is time for the odd block portion. Where we break down the weird, the wild, the head scratching paper. Excuse me, that is lighting up our tape collectively right now. It's happening right now. It's live. Not looking back at today's sessions. What's going up right now? And as I say that, I'm lying because we're going to do some reviews today. But we'll get to that in a second. Uh, first off, let's look at some live stuff. Of course, our old friend, uh, the mystery puts land of Tesla. Tesla kind of just been. It's always in, in, on a tear, but these days it kind of seems like it's especially tumultuous. In the last, oh, since in the last about week and change, it's gone from 296 all the way up to threatening 400, 387. And right now it's back to right in the middle of that safe range, right around 353 or so. And all that driven, of course, by talk of Musk apparently thinking he could go privately raise 70 plus billion dollars to take the company private, which would be the the largest LBO in history by several orders of magnitude. Uh, so that, of course, uh, driving the stock up. Then uh, the, it looks like the SEC didn't take too kindly to that, uh, which if it was uh, so other people doing it on smaller stocks might have been labeled a bit of a pumping up the stock. So they're looking at that. That, of course, cratered the stock. The bears have their claws out. The bulls have their, you know, have their just hitting horns out, gear and gore and things. It's just, it's crazy out there in Tesla land. As we're saying today, off nearly 5% or 17 and a half handles again today. So if you wanted vol, Tesla is delivering. But we, when we look at Tesla, we look out into the bluer, usually the bluer waters. Today, it looks like they're, they're pretty, pretty red. We're talking mystery puts. Uh, right now, today, they're trading 70 cents at 80 cents. So if you've been following these like we have, you know, they've been quite the odyssey. They've been, you know, 30 odd cents up to three bucks or close to it. And then right back down now to about 70 to 80 cents. So it's been quite the range for no delta puts, which goes to show you kind of how much the, the vol component can really kick in and change things. And they are on a tier again today at Jan 50 puts doing nearly a thousand contracts. Uh, OI has kind of been hovering steady for the last uh, week or so, right around 63,000, 62,500 right now. So it seems like there has been some closing paper on the strike, but nearly a 1,000 on the tape so far just at noon central today, so a little bit past it. So activity going up there. Also worth noting, the PAR is doing 1,100s and the 10 puts. Yes, the 10s. Uh, Jan 2019 10 puts, those trades, we, the contract we love to mock here even more than the 50s because the 50s are outlandish, the 10s are a whole other level and 3,836 of the Jan 2019 10 puts lighting it up today. Listeners, they are six cents at seven. We saw a bunch going up for five cents and six cents in that range. It's like some traded actually 13 cents today. My God, they got that high. Uh, so interesting stuff. Mr. Rock Lobster, is that the Carmen line fun coming in, gobbling up the Jan 2019 10 puts, sir? <laughs> um, no, we've, we, you know, we can't. Uh, we were actually looking at the uh, those VXX puts that we know are so popular. <laughs> traded somebody paid two cents for a hundred. <laughs> they traded a thousand lot last week. I assume that was you guys. No, it was not. It was not. Um, the Tesla very interesting. We discussed it in our gold open mic on Friday. Created a really good trade in there. Um, you know. The best time to fade Elon is when the noise is loudest. So, um, um, I again, this whole notion of 
him taking the company private and all uh, who the heck knows. Um, it, 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 he seems to be really, um, I don't know, almost grappling because he's, you know, he, he constantly dilutes and find, he finds ways to raise money and people are willing to give him money and, you know, um, and he probably is going to do it, but it, this, this is feeling like he's almost running out of ideas, even for somebody as creative as that guy. Um, but just just my two cents. But I, I think we could see it. You know, if, if he's actually not going to do this thing, where does the stock go back to? I don't know. It was $300 before the earnings, and the earnings weren't, you know. He's like, okay, we lost a lot of money, but we are going to be profitable eventually. And I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I just I finally figured out a way to ignore it until it has this does something crazy on the upside, and then I actually put a position on So. It's a lot easier to look at it when that happens. And in the meantime, I just ignore all of it. Sort of, you know, like uh, the other the other tweeter in chief, so to speak. <laughs> he, I think he's the number two tweeter in chief, uh, Mr. Muskis. Yes, number two. Also worth noting here, nearly 4,000 of the Jan 2020 par puts hitting the tape today on open interest of 22, almost 23,000. So roughly 20 odd percent close to it uh, going, <coughs> excuse me, going up here uh, today in the par puts, which are trading seven half at 785 right now so it's a put palooza out here in tesla today uh just across the board in the long-term stuff as well uh, i am curious about those tens i need to dig in a little bit to see what's going on there's about six thousand and change open on that strike so good chances that's somebody closing but you never know we've seen crazier things than jan 2019 10 puts. speaking of crazy things that we see we see a lot of crazy things particularly on this segment on the show and we highlight them and then we you know we we put them in our file of to be watched and we don't always have time to go back and check on them, so we thought we'd do some of that today. Uh, let's go back exactly a month to our show a month ago, July 9th. We highlighted some interesting, unusual activity. Let's go back and see how it paid off. Starting off with the Russell, I should be easy to me to say, the iShares Russell 2000 Growth Index ETF, aka IWO, closing today 212.05, back a month ago. When we were talking about it on the show, the stock was right at pretty much almost unched, about 2.12.26. Uh, so what a stock it has been on in the interim. It's got down to about 2.04 and change. And uh, that was kind of the high. On the high on the upside, it was actually nearly 2.15. So it got a little bit of a range since we talked about it a month ago. And what we saw last, uh, last time here on the show was a, it was like someone rolling a put spread out here in IWO. They were rolling it from July to August. Uh, the AUG was, the July spread was 200, 210. August was, they kept the same strikes, 200, 210 in August. So just rolling it out a month and doing it 25,000 times. So they had 20,000 in July. They upped their size to 25,000 in August. Either a sign they're desperate, usually a sign that they get maybe got a little bit of house money that they're sitting on with that that hedge having worked out. It's like they bought that 200, 210 put spread in August for 215 a month ago. Pricing it up coming into earlier this uh, this showtime was about a buck 60 on that spread. It makes sense. We're a month ahead of time and uh, you know, the stock kind of unched, but it's right around that uh, 210 strike there. Uh, spread was still open as of when we checked this. Uh, there was still over 20,000 open on each strike. Uh, except the stock hit a low of about 204.5 right around July 30th. And the put spread at the time spiked up to nearly 4 bucks, about 380. So that would probably have been, in hindsight, his, uh, his time to get out. But unfortunately, he uh, did not get a chance to do so. So we'll see if our friend... Mr. Rockloff feels like our friend may have to end up rolling again here. But, you know, if he's got this put spread on, he may probably be long the underlying. So he may not be too sad. But, again, uh, it is a lot of money to keep burning every month uh, on this vertical. What do you think? Uh, it, it certainly does look like a lot of money to burn on something. But I, I notice sometimes that people, they get it really stuck in their head that they're going to make it work. <laughs> it's like it's trying to get a – a dog to let go of a bone, even though, you know, <laughs> it might not be working or either if it's, work, you know, and they just kind of keep it up and they keep it up and they keep it up. So, um, you know, is it worth doing? <sighs> you know, I don't know. Um, maybe, maybe they get it right at some point, but um, it's just, it's one of those ones where, you know, I also look at it. Um, 
you know, and if at some point you're not right, why are you still doing the same thing? So there you go. Yeah, that could be said for uh, a lot of things <laughs> out here. Uh, so our friend, keep an eye on those AUG 200, 210 puts spread li- listeners. Maybe he'll be, end up rolling it again, or maybe he'll let it die a horrible death, or maybe it'll plunge and it'll work out for him. Uh, we shall see. Another name that we reviewed exactly a month ago was ENDP. This is Endo International PLC. Uh, closing to or closing trading right now, I should say. Got to get out of that habit of closing. Sixteen oh five off about one percent today. Uh, so kind of having a little bit of a rough day out here. But it's again, it's a cheaper name, so not a huge move. Eighteen cents. Uh, this is the name that does these days about sixty five hundred contracts a day. Today doing a good good day today. We're not looking at them today, but uh, <laughs> this is an action packed day for ENDP. We'll have to see what they're up to. Twenty nine thousand on the tape. Uh, already today. I don't know if they just, oh, they just had earnings yesterday. That would be the case on the 8th. And what we saw was activity from a month ago. Uh, it was a vertical. It was a longer term vertical. It was the Jan 2019. <clears throat> Actually, it was a weird, they were kind of rolling up a vertical. I remember this one now. It was, they were closing, it looks like the Jan 2019 seven half ten vertical, 11,400 times, and then reopening with half as many, 5,700 of the Jan 1115 verticals. Uh, and it uh, looks like the spread was rolling. The initial spread, the initial Jan 7 half 10, we found was open way back on May 30th when the stock was $6.45. Wow, this thing has been on a tier. Yes, it was that level back then. So this thing has, has, uh, has almost tripled in the last six months and change. So it's been a, quite a run for Ian. So he is sitting on some house money on this vertical. So surprising he didn't do more. That's usually what we see. But then again, maybe he just wants to keep some of his money, which also can work out. Maybe he's not quite as optimistic about this next run from 11 to 15. Either way, though, he should have been because uh, the stock, I said right now, $16 and change. So it was 12 and a half coming in uh, to earnings. And again, now uh, 16 bucks. So this vertical is looking juicy. When we analyzed this, this was actually earlier in the week. Uh, it was open for a buck thirty-seven. It was trading at the time a buck seventy. This vertical. Let's pull it up now because I have a feeling. Spoiler alert: those pesky Greeks is how they work. Spoiler alert: it's probably going to be trading for a lot more. Let's go look here. Where we have it was a Jan eleven fifteen where the strikes. Yeah, the elevens are at six bucks right now, and uh, the fifteens are oh about three bucks. So I got a nice <clears throat> excuse me three dollars on this spread looks like oi is still pretty sizable at 6500 and 7500 so he's still open but our friend may be kicking himself that he didn't do his full size either way for a buck 37 this thing is is looking pretty good he's more than doubled his money on this vertical so mr rock lobster we have looks like we have a winner winner chicken dinner here he's not taking it off yet but uh it's pretty sizable um (laughs) would you call this kind of a home run of a trade this guy's been crushing it on these verticals. His first one worked out well. And ironically, um, one of the few times we don't see someone making money and then doing like 2x on the second leg, right? And if he had, yeah. done, that, if he had, if he had done that, oh, man, how much he'd be up. But still, he's still up size, so you can't really fault this guy. The stock's tripled. Doing verticals yeah. in a stock that triples kind of works. And I think he's um, – it feels – he's still house money rolling, you know, um, and he's all the way in the money again. So – um, you're looking at what? Eleven fifteen stocks trading sixteen bucks. So, um, I I wish I could pick stuff that worked that well all the time. Um, so, or even some of the time would be great having. Uh, every once in a while, you get a home run. But uh, that's pretty fantastic trade when the stock does a triple on you. So, and all I do is look. I wait for this guy to roll again. You know, that's kind of what you. <laughs> If he's looking at it again because he thinks things are going to be fantastic, then you got a whole, you got a whole another enchilada going on. Yeah, watch. He's made so much money now. He'll probably do like fifty thousand contracts next time, and then it'll crap out, and he'll give it all away. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. But this is an interesting one. This guy clearly has been well timed and one to keep an eye on here. Uh, who knows? I don't think the stock. Who knows if the stock has it in it again? But his last earnings certainly was a shot in the arm. So I guess you can't. You can't underestimate the power of ENDP. Let's see if our third one is a charm as well. We're wrapping it up. Looking back a month ago, 
with a lot of small verticals going up, ended up adding up for a lot of size in Amgen, AMGN. Uh, at the time, let's see, a month ago on the 9th, we were looking at stock was about one, I don't know where it is right now, 194.39, it's 194 half right now. Uh, it's off about uh, actually 1%, so it has gotten higher since then. And what we were watching at the time was, well, I'll do a quick update on the stats. It's the stack in the average is about 11,700 contracts a day. Today, doing about 8,000 contracts. Looks like it's, like it's on pace to maybe hit or maybe maybe even beat. We'll see. It's, uh, it's ADV. At the time, we were looking at the August expiring on the 3rd, not regular August. August expiring on the 3rd. So this already went out. The AUG uh, 195, 200 vertical. It's going up in lots of small lots, 700, 400, so on. It added up to about 13,000 of this going up on the 9th when the stock was right around 194. Uh, you know, you do a little digging. Obviously, this trades off the books now, so you have to kind of go back into history a little bit. Uh, but uh, went off on the 3rd. You saw about 4,000 of these 195 calls, so that vertical trading about 4,000 times on the 31st when the stock was about 196. We saw about another 4,000 going up uh, when the stock on the 2nd of August, so day before expiration, when the stock was also 196 and like a half or so, and then 2,500 trading on the 3rd when the stock was actually much higher. At that point, the stock was, I think, right around 198, close to it, 197, 99. So at that point, you're looking pretty much only at the 195s because the 200s are not in play. They're a penny, at a penny. So uh, it was all the 195s, and they went out for about 3 bucks. So towards the end, that spread went out for about uh, close to three bucks. He opened it for 180 is what he paid uh, back. And on this time, I think they might have rolled actually some from July as well. He had some July 195s up there too. So maybe it was a little bit of rolling going on. But it seems like that vertical kind of kind of worked out. It was a little bit of a, and some of it was a bit of a scratch. Even on the day of expiration, he put some up for I think like 235 and things. So somebody got a better price for around 290 or 280. So that's obviously a winner. But I think on average, he ended up winning on this one. But uh, it wasn't a, a super home run, particularly when the stock is is pretty much unched, <laughs> uh, and uh, for at least for that first you know four thousand lot that you took off, uh, it wasn't it was up a bit, but it wasn't up size. So kind of a more of a mixed bag on this one, Mr. Rockloff. So it looks like he net in aggregate did all right on it, but uh, not perhaps the home run. Let's see how high did he get? Got up to two hundred ninety there, so maybe that was the key on the seventh. That was of course after expiration, so that's not going to help him. Uh, so on by expiration, the highest it got was 198 half intraday there. So he got some off around that level. So he, he did all right. He took it off in pieces, but uh, not the home run the other ones were. But still not bad, Mr. Rocklop. So you take this one, I think. No, I this again, another good win. Um, you know, stuff like where, you know, you're spending $1.50 on a $5 call spread. You know, you also have to think about how that thing is going to pay. You know, the most it's really going to pay out in any kind of short term you know, is is just a fraction of the value between the strikes. So, I mean, it worked, but you also have to look at what the payout is on those things. Um, you know, and that they don't call spreads don't make all that money until like the very end of the uh, of the term. So you have to watch it a little bit when you buy them. Um, but uh, they certainly, you know, they they can work out okay. Um, but it's it's another thing is everybody looks at those PL charts and they're like, oh my God, they look at the expiration chart and sometimes you have to wait because there's premium in that short contract until the you know until just the bitter end uh, on a lot of those things. So there's a reason why that is, of course, uh, because the put side synthetic equivalent uh, always has a value till the end to right till the end. But um, you know I, I would I always will take a win, but you know, five dollar call spreads. Spending a lot of money on five dollar call spreads is kind of a, you know, I'm just going to call that a, a kind of a met as a, as a trade concept. A resounding. Little, I'm a little. I'm a little rough on that one. It made money, but, you know, he got a. There was it wasn't a bad move in the stock for the actual money they got. Yeah, you're right. It wasn't. It wasn't terrible. But I'm with you. Not, not my first go-to choice for trades, but uh, you never know. Speaking of go-tos, let's see what yours is because it's time for you guys to choose what Uncle Mike talks about in this week's Strategy Block. It's time to dispense options, wit, wisdom, and education. It's time for the Strategy Block. All right, Uncle Mike, are you ready, sir? I shall reveal the answers. 
I am waiting with bated breath. All right. Looks like we have a bit of a tie here, which is and votes are still coming in, but I'm just going to have to call it right now so that we could, uh, we could proceed with the segment. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll be waiting. But, uh, yeah, it looks like it's an interesting tie right now. We gave them four choices. Our medal's a buy now. How much higher can we go in the markets overall? Uh, can SBX hit 3,000 in 18 months? Or his favorite, his stalwart, his go-to, WWF champs from 1984 to 1988. Mr. Uncle Mike, you'll actually be happy. We have a tie. So you get to choose maybe a combo segment. It's a tie with uh, our medals of buy now at 40% and WWF champs at 40% right now. Uh, so I guess you got to pick them, sir, or maybe a combo, you whatever know, you feel like. You, you know what? I'll do a little bit of a combo in the interest of the integrity of the show, but I got to I gotta run with the WWF champs because it's one where um, I've been waiting on this one for <laughs> you have a been, long, long you time. You have been champing at the bit on this one, sir. So have at it. All right. Well, let's start off with the medals. So right now the medals are a little bit deflated at this point in time. So in looking at uh, my beloved SLV, which by the way, uh, make sure you tune into Twifo this week, which which I will be a guest on. Uh, we're uh, recording that shortly. We can talk a little bit more about it then. But if you look at the medals, or at least silver, uh, over the course of the last couple of months, uh, we hit highs, and I'm looking at SLV, of uh, just over 16. It's down in the 14 half range. So uh, from a technical standpoint, if you look at a one-year chart, uh, that ain't good. Um, in looking at it, though, uh, we have been kind of channeling over the course of the last uh, almost about a month or so in the mid-14s with silver. So from a technical standpoint, we are in a bit of a range at this point, and we have been for the last few weeks. So now the uh, million-dollar question, of course, is where do we go from here? Now, the last time we were this low, uh, looking around, at least with silver anyway, uh, looking in November of 2015, uh, we did get as low, the, alt the uh, low in the most recent low was $13.19. But when we hit that, we rallied pretty sharply. So in looking at a 20-year chart of silver, we're at the lower end right now. Uh, I remember we even talked about a lot on this show back in 2011. Silver SLV got as high as 48.35. But the way with which it did it, it came like a thief in the night. Just all of a sudden, one day, uh, it seemed like it was almost instant uh, that silver was uh, went from uh, the low 20s or the mid-teens uh, all the way up to 48 in a very quick amount of time. I remember we were just joking about uh, uh Illinois government and how their pension funds were underfunded. We, I remember just joking at that time saying, oh, wow, they must have been short silver. <laughs> so with it, uh, silver is something that can come like a thief in the night. And I believe that is it going to channel for a little while longer? Yeah, I believe so. But when it does rally, and it will have another rally at some point, don't know when by any means, it's not going to be, it's not a trending metal. It's more of a challenging metal, or I'm sorry, it's not a trending underlying. It's something that is more channeling, and then all of a sudden, whoop, it's all of a sudden triples one day, it seems. So if you are looking to get into silver or gold for that matter, uh, I believe that they are a buy right now. I own them myself. Uh, clients own them for various things. And we'll talk more about the details of what we have on Twifo. Shameless plug. Mark will be proud of me for that. But with that, I think you need to have patience with them and how you're trading them, how you're looking at them, because it's one of those one. It's, it's a situation to where in the long run, I think it's going to be a good thing to be in. But I believe it's going to take a while to uh, make things well and make things right. All right. Now, on to the segment that I have been waiting and hoping to do for a long period of time, WWF Champions from 1984 to 1988. Uh, with this, I want to give you guys a little bit of the history of the WWF around the early 80s. Uh, Vince McMahon Sr. ran the, WW, the WWF until he wanted, until he passed it down for the most part to his son, Vince Jr., who is now the uh, icon who runs it today, still to this day. And so Vince McMahon had an idea. He wanted to take wrestling national. Now, that was a crazy idea at the time because most wrestling promoters just had local uh, promotions. Uh, like, for example, uh, the biggest one at the time was the AWA, Vern Gagne's promotion uh, that was uh, very big in the Midwest. And Vince Sr. thought it was really a bad idea. He thought his son was crazy, but he let him do it. And uh, in doing so, obviously, the WWF is very huge today. Now, Vince McMahon did not make any friends amongst other promoters in the early 80s. One thing that he did 
was the AWA, if you look at a vast majority of all the stars of the WWF from the 80s, vast majority of them, if not all of them, were one, were in the AWA just a couple years earlier. Andre the Giant, Hulk Hogan, um, the Iron Sheik, I mean, you name it, they were in the WWF, or I'm sorry, in the AWA before coming over to the WWF. So let's get to the history of the champions. Now, we're actually going to start about five days before 1984, because on December 26th, 1983, the old champion, Bob Backlund, he was actually a good guy. He lost the belt to the Iron Sheik on December 26th, 1983. It was not a very highly publicized match, but it was one to where the WWF wanted to really promote Hulk Hogan, this new guy that they brought into their federation from the AWA. Now, with that, Hulk Hogan, of course, had a history uh, through the AWA. He played Thunderlips in Rocky III. Uh, and, uh, the wrestling promoters did not really like him doing that very much because they felt it was taking away from uh, his, his wrestling and they wanted pieces of the action. And uh, Vern Gagne was not a fan of that by any means. But when Hulk Hogan went over to the WWF, uh, there was actually still a lot of bad blood towards him from Vern Gagne, the head of the AWA. Uh, little known fact, the Iron Sheik was actually uh, offered $100,000 if he would break Hulk Hogan's leg on January 23rd, 1984, when Hulk Hogan ultimately won the title. And the Iron Sheik could have easily done it. The Iron Sheik was a champion wrestler at, on the amateur side of it. And back in that time, uh, in terms of who in just a, a straight up street fight or an amateur style wrestling match, Iron Sheik would have no doubt beaten anybody in there. So with that, uh, the WWF's um, golden era begins when Hulk Hogan won the championship on December 20, I'm sorry, on January 23rd, 1984. Now, a lot of things happened during that time frame. Uh, in 1985, the first WrestleMania actually ever came, came to play. And the main event for that mat for the first ever WrestleMania was Hulk Hogan teaming up with Mr. T and they were taking on a tag team of Rowdy Piper and Mr. Wonderful Paul Orndorff. Now, some people in the financial world believe that Mr. Wonderful is the, that guy on shark tank tank. Uh, -uh. it was Paul Orndorff back in the eighties. He was the original Mr. Wonderful. Uh, but with that, that was a huge event that changed the world. And a lot of people don't know this as well. Mr. T almost did not go into WrestleMania. He got upset with the promoters and he was not a happy man. And Hulk Hogan had to calm him down and actually convince him to go out and take and do the wrestling match. But he did. And of course, the rest, as they say, is history. Now, a very notable title defense within this era was WrestleMania three Pontiac Silverdome 1987. Hulk Hogan was taken on Andre the Giant. A new United States indoor attendance record was set. 93,000 people to watch an indoor event. Uh, never been done before. The Pontiac Silverdome. Now, on a little bit of a side note, this is how much of a wrestling fan I am. I actually had a game that I was playing with the Buffalo Bills in preseason in the Pontiac Silverdome. And so usually as a player, you go out maybe two or three hours before the game, kind of walk around the field, go get taped, whatever. But I can remember standing there, I'm thinking, holy cow. This is where it all took place. That must be where Bobby the Brain Heenan walked out. This this could be the same <laughs> locker room that Andre the Giant dressed in. I was so excited about that. But in that match, uh, it was billed as um, Andre the Giant had never been slammed before. And one of the most historic moments in WWF history is when Hulk Hogan slammed Andre the Giant in front of 93,000 people. Now, in reality, Andre the Giant had been slammed before, but it was still an electrical moment nonetheless. So with that being said, all this really went well until there was some controversy in February of 1988 to where Andre the Giant actually did win the match, but Jack Tunney, the president of the WWF at the time, decided it was not official. So the belt was vacant for roughly a month and a half until Randy the Macho Man Savage won it on March 27th, 1988 in a tournament to determine who actually was the champion. Now, of course, there was the thing that was going with uh, Hulk Hogan teaming up with the Macho Man and then jealousy over Elizabeth. But then after that, in early April of 89, the Hulkster won the belt again and the reign of Hulk Hogan continued. All in all, during this era, from 84 to 88, 
Hulk Hogan held the belt for 1,500 days. An amazing feat considering all the great competition that exists in the WWF. Folks, that is the strategy block for our debut of the Noon Hour show, and thank you for letting me do that from the bottom of my heart. You've been waiting on that one for a while. <laughs> I had no idea you were so 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 versed in the uh, in the history of WWF, sir, and WWE. You have no idea, <laughs> dude. That's that's encyclopedic knowledge. I now, do you own any WWE stock now that it's you know it's going mainstream? Yeah, it's three X what it was a few months ago. <laughs> <laughs> Buy it now. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, I, I, you know, it, I, ever since the eighties, I really did not, I have not been a fan. That was the golden era. Once the golden era was over, there was a cool era in the late nineties when the WCW and the NWO for a couple of years. But in all honesty, that was the golden era of wrestling. I don't think it's any good anymore compared to that. It, it, they, they're like Apple in that they changed the world in the eighties with the rock and wrestling connection and the cartoons on Saturday and all the other stuff. I didn't even have time to talk about, but, uh, Right now, it's it's still obviously a good company, but uh, that was they changed the world in the '80s. How are you going to match that? It is indeed a, a tough act to follow, but the stock price showing that uh, the market at least thinks they're uh, they're crushing it these days. Uh, meanwhile, let's keep on rolling. Let's do a real quick uh, check in with you guys on our mail block. It's time to take your seat on the All Star Panel as we read your emails, tweets. Facebook messages, website comments, and much more. It's time for The Mail Block. Well, our question of the week, Mr. Rock Lobster, you could probably guess uh, what it is. You guys can find it for yourselves. You've been voting over there at Options. Uh, we asked you at the beginning of the week. You know, you guys are, many of you guys are just fascinated with this ongoing saga. We talk about a lot of involved views once in a while on here, too, when I tease The Rock Lobster and the Mr. Uh, Mr. Sebastian, uh, we te- you guys are fascinated with the ongoing saga of these VXX January 10 puts. Uh, the open interest is huge, well over 200,000, and thousands continue to trade all the time. Saw a big thousand lot going up not too long ago. As Rob Oster was saying someone paid two cents for a uh, hundred or so this morning. So they're trading, continue the trading uh, on the tape. Our question for you guys, quite simply, would you guys trade these? Yes, you'd buy them for a penny. It's about where they're trading these days. Uh, or you, yes, you'd sell them for a penny. Or no, it's just gambling. Or you already have enough of these freaking things, uh, Mr. Rock Lobster. We'll start with you. Uh, what do you? What, I know what your answer is on would you trade them because you have many of them. But uh, would uh, what do you think our audience is voting for? I think our audience is voting. Um, I would. They would pay a penny for them. Yeah, they would pay a penny. You wouldn't want to sell them for a penny. So, and of course, you know my answer is yes. We have enough of them. So there you go. You're in the. You're in that chunk, Mr. Uncle Mike. Any thoughts, sir? Uh, for me, no, nah, it's not, not for me for trading them, but, uh, I would say the audience would buy them for a penny. Yep. 57% buying them for a penny. There was a decent chunk that would sell them before that's gone down. Thankfully only 11% now would sell them for a penny. <laughs> uh, 25% saying, no, it's just gambling. I can't really take issue with that either. And, uh, 7% saying they have enough. They're in the rock lobster camp. Uh, they have, what did one of our listeners say? Oh, they have an Imelda Marcos shoe shopping size amount of buying these things so uh, if you've done that listeners then you probably have uh, enough as well really quickly since we didn't get a chance to discuss it on monday you guys you guys probably remember we did our most important poll we ever did in the history of our show indeed in our network uh, over the weekend actually it was a weekend poll uh, it was uh, it's keeping with Uncle Mike's off-topic wrestling theme. We asked everybody <laughs> on uh, over the weekend. There was big news in the land of of, of media and pop culture that uh, Captain Picard returning to the captain's chair after a two-decade hiatus uh, there. So we asked you guys, fun off-topic options break. Who is your favorite Trek captain of all time? Gave you four choices: Picard, Kirk, Cisco, or Janeway. I have the answers here. You guys don't look at the show notes. Don't cheat. First off, what is your answer, Mr. Rock Lobster? Who's your vote? And what do you think our audience voted for? I, I don't know how you beat Captain Kirk. You know, I just, I don't know how you beat Captain Kirk. So he would be my answer. And I would, I would say, I'm going to say everybody would go with Kirk just because, you know, he was the original. All right, I will be muting you now for the rest of the show. That goes to tell you what, what my answer is. Mr. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Uncle Mike, <laughs> what is your choice, sir? I can't say I was much of a Trekkie through the years, but my 
Uh, my dad was, and I think he, he was a fan of Captain Kirk. So, um, but he, he watched the show when it, back when it debuted in the sixties. So it's, it's hard to convince him of anything else. Uh, when it comes to that. So I'll go with Captain Kirk as well. Our audience is a bunch of heathens like you guys. 47% choosing Kirk. Only 40% for Picard. I thought he would take it. Uh, 9% for Cisco. Got some hardcores out there. 4% for Janeway. I was surprised by that. Uh, she doesn't get a lot of love. So uh, interesting stuff. Uh, yeah, a bunch of heathens in our audience. I'm going to meet the two of you at the rest of the show as well. As we keep on rolling into our final segment, it is time for Around the Block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. All right, everybody, welcome to Around the Block. You know the drill. We tell you what we're keeping an eye on for the rest of this, of today, I should say, today's trading session, as well as uh, the rest of the week. I'm still fascinated with this Funko. I need to dig into why this thing is pricing in about a $4 straddle on a $20 stock going into earnings. Uh, it seems it seems rich, but I, I know nothing about the history of this name, so I'll have to do a little bit. Maybe a little Orats folks have done that for me. I can go check, see what their earnings movie report says about Funko, because that seems quite juicy for a $20 stock, but we shall see. Mr. Rock Lobster, in addition to all your slinging of Funko, uh, what else are you keeping an eye on for the rest of this week into the weekend, sir? Um, so, so going back to the 10 puts, so right now, let's see, VXX is in the 27 handle, and it's decaying at about a dollar per week. So, you know, with VIX cash down here and very high contango, now we're at $4 per month. We've got, uh, let's say, August, September, October. You could, VXX could be, could be down 12 bucks in um, three months. So... I'm just saying um, it is uh, it is those those puts could be worth something uh, if we I mean, I have no idea how Vol will stay benign going into the election because uh, Goss knows what's going to happen. Um, but, you know, keeping an eye on VXX, there's uh, there's been some good opportunity in the Vol newsletter has been perking up again. So. Again, a great way to learn how to trade volatility through just subscribing to the newsletter. But um, we're looking at that. I'm looking to see how this Tesla thing pans out. Um, and, you know, to see if I think the queues uh, might be closing at an all-time high as we speak right now. So uh, maybe for the show on Monday, uh, Mr. Uh, Tussock can come back in with his, uh, his famous line, never in the history has there ever, ever been a better time to sell the QQQ? So um, those are the big things and the stuff that just kind of keeps pushing this market up have been like good fundamentals. So as long as um, whatever this trade war is, I, I guess somebody, everybody just forgot about it. Like, okay, it's it's cool. They're, now we're just going to throw tariffs on each other and everybody's going to realize how stupid that is. So maybe uh, we'll have better trade policy. So we'll see. So I feel like the market's betting on that to some degree, and we're just going to see if it happens. Well, you know, uh, I just dumped a lot of my VXX downside, so you know it's going to just implode. Uh, right? As soon as we get off the show here, it's going to immediately drop to 16. Uh, so uh, so maybe, maybe I jinxed it for all of us. I don't know. But we shall, we shall see forthwith. Mr. Uncle Mike, sir, what are you keeping an eye on in addition to your beloved uh, WWF superstars from back in the day? Uh, for sure, for sure. Uh, I think you know we, we're about nine points away from an all-time high in the S and P. So curious to see if we can actually get that. Uh, like what Andrew was saying. Uh, so watching that, and then also uh, want to see. I'm also just kind of don't have a position in it, but I think it might be a, one of those uh, the breadth of the the breadth of the market type of things is Apple. Uh, if Apple can stay above the one trillion mark uh, in terms of market cap. Uh, I think that's that can be kind of a strong level of support for Apple in, in such a way. And plus, it kind of coincides with the two hundred dollar per share mark. But uh, if we can do that, uh, it's kind of like I believe the Roger Bannister effect, in that uh, no one could run a, a four minute mile till Roger Bannister did it, and then like eight people did it within a year. And so now that Apple actually did cross uh, the trillion dollar mark for market cap. Uh, there might be some other companies that are doing that and uh, could be good things ahead for us bulls out there. Unfortunately, there's not much ahead, at least for this show. But if you're intrigued, you want to hear more, maybe you like yourself a little bit, Uncle Mike. You want to get a double dose of them today? Well, you're in luck if you're listening live 
Stay tuned. Come back in about 28 minutes for the start of TWIFO this week in Futures Options. We'll be talking a lot of equities on that show today. So Russell 2000, E-mini, all that kind of fun stuff. As well as maybe, maybe I can twist his arm and talk a little silver. We shall see. As well as whatever else we got on the docket. You never know. It's this weekend. So we'll see what's going on. Probably a little crude spoiler alert. Maybe a little other fun stuff. We shall see. This week in Futures Options coming at you at its new normal time of 1.30 p.m. Central, 2.30 p.m. Eastern every Thursday. So we got you covered. Double dose of shows on Thursday. Then, of course, come back here on Friday. For Bob View, still at its normal time, noon Central, 1 p.m. Eastern. Special guest returning. Returning guest. Um, the old the, the old keeper of Russell's weekly rundown returning for an in-studio appearance. So uh, we shall see how that goes. Meanwhile, let's go back around the horn one last time. We'll start with the Rock Lobster Syrup. I'm intrigued by things like these VXX puts or VIX Zone Negative 6. Uh, where should I go? What should I do? Uh, our Vol Newsletter, great place to go at optionpit.com uh, for a very reasonable monthly price. Uh, you can easily make that uh, with the Vol trades that we look at. Um also, uh, look for our next Made Easy series coming, so lots of good stuff there. All these scumbags just joining me on my offer here on some of these puts. It's like you, Mr. Rock Lobster. It is with and, uh, and driving me crazy. <laughs> I'm making new liquidity, and they're just, just lemmings, just just uh, lampreys leeching onto me. All right, Mr. Uncle Mike, while I go deal with this, what, uh, what do you got cooking for our listeners, sir? By all means, give me a call. Shoot me an email. Check out my website stcharleswealth.com if you're interested in a financial advisor uh, who's not afraid of the option product and who also knows a lot about professional wrestling history. There you go. Hit him up, stcharleswealth.com. Doesn't have any wrestlers on his website because that's copyright infringement. He does have a sweet fox. So go check it out, stcharleswealth.com to learn more. On behalf of Uncle Mike and the Rock Lobster and indeed myself, thanks for joining us at our new bat time. Hope you liked it. And we'll be coming at you this time for the foreseeable future. So put it in your book, set it and forget it. Or don't forget it, set it at least, (laughs) and then remember it for when we come on. And otherwise, we'll see you in about 25 minutes for Twifle. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider or via questions at the options insider.com.